Good morning, Grade Twelves, and welcome to this morning's online class for mathematics. Um, as you know, I usually just allow a little bit of time to make sure that everyone who wanted to join in did join in for this session. Um, so I will be with you in approximately two minutes time. Right, so good morning, Grade 12. If I didn't greet you, welcome to the session this morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me yet, so let me just get there. I am Linky Young and I am the Education Specialist for Mathematics and Sciences at MPAC. So before we kick off this class, um, I would like to just cover some basics. But if you're struggling to hear me, Please make sure that your audio is on and that your volume is turned up. As you know, when you join into the session, you're, um, you will be muted. I do allow time for asking questions where I will unmute you and allow you to ask your question on this platform. As you can see, there's a little hand icon on your dashboard. You can quickly test that out. That is when you want to put up your hand when I allow time for asking questions. Um, when you press on it again, it will take down your hand. So you're welcome to test that out quickly. Come guys, press on the hands. So I want to see that you can hear me and you know how the system works. There you go. That's better. Okay, and you can put down your hand when you are done. Okay, you can download this presentation in PDF format in the handout box below. So do that during this session as it won't be available after the broadcast is stopped on this platform. Um, it will be uploaded to, to Guided Learning, but um, yeah, when you can down, download it now, then you have it. Right, so we encourage our attendees to ask questions and leave comments. However, should you leave any irrelevant or inappropriate comments, you will be dismissed from the session. So during the session, I usually get to all the academics questions that you might ha have regarding the topic, but should the session end and you still have some academic questions, you're welcome to send an email to academics at impact.co.zi. I also refer back to the question box whenever I allow for questions. So when you're not comfortable with asking your question out loud, you're welcome to type it into the question box and I will answer it from there. Should there be at the end of the session any unanswered questions, I will provide you feedback via email. Um, 
And if there was unanswered questions and I didn't um, reply back to you via email, you're welcome to send an email to info at impact.co.za. So all of our previous online classes is available for download, the, the recordings of those sessions on our website. And I will just show you again, as I've done in our previous session, where to find it on the website at the end of this session. Okay, let me quickly see, is everyone ready? Um, you can put up your hand if you can hear me and you're ready so that we can start off with this session. There we go. I like what I'm seeing. Okay, I am just for now going to take down everyone's hand so that we can focus on the content for today. So you will see there I've said that we're going to do some calculus revision for today. And why I've mentioned it as revision is that you should have started with revision uh, with calculus already in term one and then just a little bit of um, calculus in term two and you should have been done with that before we started with the online classes. So this is really the only part of term two that we didn't do as an online class. So I thought it well to just work in this revision class for calculus for today. So I also think um, I should just tell you how it will work in the future from now on. So today will be your last online class that covers term two topics. You will now have a little bit of a break up until the 13th of July. So in this time period, on the 1st of July, you will receive your June examination papers. Now, all of you know by now that your June examination papers will not be written as a formal assessment. So you will receive your June examination papers for revision purposes. So what I would like you to do is to prepare for those papers as if you would have written an examination. Write your examination paper at home. You will also receive the memorandum so you can mark it as well. And then from the 13th of July, so the week of the 13th, you will have June examination revision online classes. So then I will work through that paper with you. Um, and talk about why answers are actually given as they are. Then the week thereafter, we will have a prelim, um, prelim prep session for you. So how to prepare and what you can expect in the prelim examinations. After that, we will carry on with term three online classes. Okay, so in a nutshell for today is your last term two topic online class. You will have a bit of a break and then I will see you again when we do June examination revision online class. Okay, so like I said, today I would like us to do a bit of revision on calculus. And I think we should just look at all the topics that you need to cover in calculus for grade 12. Now, calculus is one of the very few topics that is only done in grade 12. So this is the first year that you have done this and you didn't carry it over from the previous years. So you don't have to worry about prior knowledge. You need to focus on calculus of grade 12. So what should you know with calculus? So firstly, you need to understand the concept of limit. So you need to understand what is a limit and you've done this in term one. Then you need to do differentiation from first principles and they will clearly state that in the question. So derive the following from first principles. So those two words, first principles, is your clue as to what you should do. Then you need to be able to use differentiation rules. So this, this differentiation rules that you use in grade 12 is only the tip of the iceberg. There is a lot of differentiation rules, but we only actually use one. Um, and we actually manipulate our um, equation so that we can use that one differentiation rule. Then you need to be able to determine the equation of a tangent to a graph and, of course, the relationship that it has with the graph and the equations of the graph. So I am going to do a question like that today for revision. And of course, drawing graphs and cubic functions, 
And then it also involves practical problem solving, where they usually talk about maximum, minimum values, optimization. So all of these topics you can kind of expect in a calculus question, and they are quite easy to identify when you work through old question papers. So go and do a bit of research, work through old questions so that you can get exposed to different ways of what calculus can be asked like um, and how it can be assessed in an examination. Calculus can be fine and will be assessed in paper one. So when you prepare for paper one, you should include this in your preparation. You will not prepare calculus for paper two. So don't spend time on it for paper two. Paper one is the paper in which calculus will be assessed. Right, so as you know, with revision, I usually tag old question papers and um, I work through the different questions with you. So this specific question I found from the Eastern Cape September paper one of 2019. Um, so I've came across all of this Eastern Cape papers and I'm really impressed with the standard and the quality of the papers. So when you come across any of those papers, you're welcome to work through them as well. Okay, so question eight says, um, in 8.1, determine F accent X. Now that accent over there actually tells me that they want the derivative. Um, please excuse the handwriting because I'm working with the mice at this moment, okay? So they want you to determine the derivative from first principles. So like I said, they will always use these words first principles, and that means that you should make use of a specific method to derive this equation. Now, with first principles, you will have to make use of a formula, and this formula is on your um, formula sheet. So, luckily in grade 12, you are getting a formula sheet, and you will find this formula on the formula sheet. Also important to remember your notation. So I am going to make reference to notation during this session. Um, this is one place where notation is quite important, okay? For example, the accent that I talked about here with your derivative, it's not to the power negative one. To the power negative one is an inverse function. So this is a, a notation that I'm talking about. These are also notations and I'm gonna show you um, how you should actually present your questions. So like I said, the, the key words over here are first principles. And that gives me an indication of what method I should use. And this is the equation that I talked about. And you will find this on your um, formula sheet. Let's just start at the top. So I have my normal equation of my function that they have given over there for me. So I have that. I now need to find if x plus h, and I'm just going to substitute in every x value this x plus h. So I'm going to say 3 minus 2, and then x plus h squared. And then just a little bit of simplification. So the formula says, and this is where your um, notation is important. So when you're substituting, when you are simplifying, this limit where h um, approaches zero always stays like this. The moment where you substitute a zero with your h, or the h with your zero, that will fall away. But I'm going to show you that now again. Okay, so the formula says that f is x plus h minus fx divided by h. So you say if x plus h, it's this equation over here, and I've substituted in there, minus, and then fx is this formula over here. And then you just simplify a bit, and then the whole, um, how can I say, 
the whole trick and the magic happen is happening over here. Where I want to take out an H and, and cancel that with the H in the denominator because I cannot divide with a zero. And in the end, I want to substitute a zero into the value, uh, into the H value over there. Okay, so I need to get rid of the H in my denominator, which was part of the original equation over there. So I want to look at my numerator at the top, simplify it as much as I can, and then take out a common X, so factorizing it. Taking out a common factor, um, which I would like it to be an H so that I can cancel them out and I'm only left with this. So it's not a fraction that includes my H. I do not want an H in my denominator. Right. So now what I can do is I can substitute zero into my H and I get my answer as negative 4X. So if you are like me and you want to make sure that I've done this correctly because it's easy and it counts five marks, I don't want to lose five marks out of a simple mistake that I've made. So I would just go and test myself. You can do it on the side, don't do it as part of the question and just make sure that you did derive correctly. And you can do that by simple um, differentiation rules. So the rule says, I need to take my exponent of x, multiply it with my coefficient, and then subtract a um, one from my exponent over there. So when I have a constant value, it's equal to zero. If I derive it, again, I'm just apologizing for the handwriting. A constant will become zero because three is actually equal to three X to the power zero, right? Because X to the power zero is one, your exponent rules. One times three is equal to three. So if I say zero times three, it becomes a zero. That's why a constant becomes a zero. Then I have this term over here where I'm gonna take my two and multiplying with the negative two at the front which will be negative four X to the power one, because it's two minus one, same in the end. And I don't write to the power one, so it's equal to negative four X. And you will see it's the same as what you have calculated with your first principle. So you can do that very quickly, just to check, didn't I miss, didn't I make a mistake with my simplification or my factorization in this question? because I don't want to lose these five marks as they are easy marks to pocket. Okay, so then 8.2 comes across and you see it looks so very difficult because there's brackets and there's some funny notation over there. Don't worry about the notation. You can forget about the notation. You can just write it in the end if you'd like. And they didn't say from first principle, so you don't have to do this whole long step thingy over here. That rule that I talked about here is the only thing that you're going to use. You're going to make sure that you don't have any fractions and you're going to take your exponent and multiply it with a coefficient and then subtract one from the exponent in the end. Okay. So this is exactly what you're going to do over here. So you're gonna write down the question, still keeping your dx over there. It means you want to derive in reference to x because there's only x's, okay? This one says you need to derive y in reference to x. Derive y, so you want y accent in terms of x's. Okay, but we will get to this one. So firstly, before I can start my deriving, I need to make this in the form that I can work with. So I'm gonna multiply out my brackets, simplify it. And the moment that I apply a differentiation rule, the dx falls away. So in your simplification, in your factorization, in all of those three workings before you actually derive and apply a, um, 
differentiation rule, your notation should, should stay there. The moment you apply that rule, it falls away and you just give your answer. Okay, so let's look at how it looks. So there you will see, we just copied the answer and this notation stays while I'm working with this inside over here. So multiplying out the bracket and then multiplying in the X, I didn't apply any differentiation rule as of yet. Now I'm going to apply the rule where I'm going to say 3 times 1 is 3. 3 minus 1 is 2. 2 times negative 4 is negative 8. 2 minus 1 is 1. 1 times 4 is 4. X, um, 1 minus 1 is 0, so I don't write that X over there. So the moment I apply this rule, this differentiation rule, do you see that my notation falls away? Okay, so usually you will only be penalized once for notation, but we don't know what the examiner um, would like us to do. So rather concentrate and work on your notations. Do not lose any unnecessary marks because we don't want to lose unnecessary marks, okay? Right. So the next question I want us to, to look at how we need to work with this. So like I said, um, with this rules that we would like to apply, we want no fractions, especially, I mean, a fraction with an X in there. And you will see that this also goes hand in hand with a lot of exponent rules. So in this case, what I will do is I need to convert the square root X to a um, exponent. And you know that anything to do that's under a square, square root can be written as x to the power a half. Remember that law inside over outside? Okay, so this can actually, actually replace the square root x here at the bottom, but I don't want a denominator. I need to move it up, okay? So my x to the power a half becomes multiplying with x to the power negative a half. That negative a half plus this one, because it's an exponent law, um, will then give you a positive half. But let's see, it will be included in the steps. Right. So the question was just written down for you. I'll see. dy dx shows you the derivative, the answer in the end. But do you see it's opposite than this one? This one tells you it still needs to be arrived, derived. This one tells you it's not derived yet, but this is the derivative. Okay. So I've written down the question over there. And now I need to work with the square root x because I don't have a law as yet as how to work with it. So I need to convert it into a workable form so that I can actually derive that. So x, square root x can be replaced with x to the power of half, like I've mentioned here with your exponent rules. Then I need to take it up. Now you will see there, one of these steps are omitted. So I will actually have negative 2x times this x to the power negative a half. Okay? So what does my exponent rule say? When I have the same basis and it's multiplying, I can add my exponent. So this will just be negative 2x to the power a half because 1 plus minus a half is a half. And that is where this x to the power a half comes from, plus 3. Okay, so up until this point, I've only simplified and change it into a workable form. Now I'm going to apply my differentiation rule and I'm gonna say three over seven multiplying with a will be three over seven a and then three over seven minus one will then give you this answer over there. Okay, right. So then I have negative two times a half that is negative one and you'll have a half minus one is negative a half. 
and then this is a constant which is zero and you don't need to write. Okay, so only at this final stage you need to write that you have derived, so your dy over dx. Okay, quickly put up your hands, ask in the question box if you have any questions. Um, I see this one in here. How did you find if accent x the negative ax squared? So let me just go there. Negative ax squared. Uh, let me quickly see our negative ax. Um, Ix. Kayla, I am going to answer as I think that you might ask or what you are asking. You see, you say you want to know where did I find Ax. So Ax was given in the question. So A in this case is also a coefficient of x. So it's like a two or a three times x. So instead of a value there, I only have a variable and I don't have to derive to that. So this is seen as a, as a coefficient, something that multiplies with x. So it's like three over seven multiplying with two. In this case, it will just be three over seven multiplying with a. Um, so I hope this answers your question. That's the only place that I see in ax. Okay, then Janice says she doesn't understand the negative four over seven. So remember, this was three over seven. So that multiplied with the A. Now I need to say three over seven minus one. And one is seven over seven, right? So three minus seven is negative four. So that's where your negative four over seven comes from. Um, so Kayla asks, why did you differentiate the ax when a is a variable? So like I said, a is not seen as a variable over here. It's seen as a coefficient of x, a number or a thing that is multiplying with x, just as you have um, yeah, negative 2 times x. So a is seen as a value that multiplies with x, okay? Because it's not mentioned over here. So that is why a will multiply with your three over seven in the front, just as two would have multiplied with three over seven. Okay, um, let me just quickly see if there's any hands. There's no hands going up at this stage. Okay. Guys, I've answered the questions that was posted in the question box. Um, if Kayla and Janice can just post in the question box if your question was answered and you understand what I said, um, I am going to move on so long. All right. So let me just take off all this ugly scribbling. Otherwise, that would influence the next question. Okay. So this question over here is actually um, also from the same paper, question nine, where they have given a graph. And I want you to look very carefully because one of the questions that was given to you in a task or a test or some extra work that I gave some of the students had the same um, approach to it, and a lot of you missed this information. What you have missed, and that's before I'm going to read the question because I just want to make you attentive to that, is that the graph, uh, the, the graph drawn is not the graph of the original function. It is the graph of the derivative. And what is my derivative? That is actually the equation of the slope of my tangents around 
my original function. So when I have a function like this, I'm just going to draw it up here for you. This is my function. And then your derivative will be all of this tangents gradients put into the form of a function uh, of a function of a graph and when i have a cubic function it will always be then of course a parabola okay this is a positive one so it will have a positive derivative okay so let's read the diagram below shows the graph of y is equal to g accent x. Remember that accent tells me that it is the derivative. Where g x, my original um, graph, my original function is a cubic function. So a x to the power of 3 plus b x squared plus c x plus d. The graph of g accent x, the one that's given, the y-axis at 1. So the point there will be 0, 1 because my x value is 0. And on the x-axis at negative a third, 0, 1, 0. It's your x-intercepts. So before we go, I want us to talk about these points that were given. So these are stationary points. Why? Stationary points are the points where my derivative, the value of my derivative, and value refers to y values, the value of my derivative is equal to zero. You know that stationary points, you do first derivative, you put that equal to zero. So the value of that new function equal to zero means that your y value of that is equal to zero, which is your x intercept so when a g accent x or a derivative function is drawn your x intercepts will be your stationary points All right okay so now they say at 9.1 write down the x coordinates of the stationary points of g luckily they've already given us this um, derivative function and I know my, where my derivative function is equal to zero, in this case, my x-intercepts is my stationary points. And I only want my x-coordinates, so it is where x is negative a third and where x is one. Oh, let me just take away that drawing for us. So where x is negative a third and where x is equal to one. Now they say determine the x coordinate of the point of inflection. So the point of inflection you get when you take a second derivative and put that equal to zero. What does that mean? It means that when I draw tangents to my first derivative, where my tangents gradient is zero, meaning I have a horizontal line. That is where my point of inflection is. And that is my turning point of my first derivative. And that's easy to get. I already have my x coordinates. So I need to find actually the x value of the axis of symmetry. So right in the middle between these two values over here. So you add them together, divide with two to get the value that you have over there. So one plus negative a third, and you're gonna divide it by two because I want to find the midpoint. That's my ax axis of symmetry, which is also the turning point or the X value of the turning point of a parabola, and which will indicate the inflection point because I'm working with a first derivative x coordinate for the point of inflection will then be a third. Okay, so that was a lot of things that I mentioned over there. Um, if you are unsure of this, I've also added a lot of links to videos and stuff that you can, can go and have a look at. Remember, this is a revision class and um, I'm just giving you a bit of pointers as how to approach some of these questions. 
Right, so 9.3 says, determine the value of x for which g is an increasing function. So let's just think about this again. Now they talk about my original function, okay? So when it is increasing, I know that all my tangents will have a positive gradient, okay? Now, this is a graph of all the gradients of the tangents at the different points to this original function. So I want to know where the gradients are positive. It means that where is this graph positive? So above the x-axis, right? And it is from negative a third up until one. So where is my function an increasing function? That is when my tangent has a positive um, gradient. So when I look at the graph of my um, gradients of tangents, I want to know where it has a positive value. I just quickly want to check in the question box. Um, so Kayla says that is stationary point not a turning point? No. Your stationary points is your turning points of your original function, yes. Of your original function, it is your turning points, the stationary points. But remember, they've given you the graph of a the first derivative. And that is where the value of my first derivative is equal to zero. Remember when they give you a, an equation of your original graph and say that you need to find the points of the stationary points, you will first arrive at and equate that to zero, correct? For stationary points. So you don't have the equation of my original function, but I do have the graph of my first derivative. And I know that when my first derivative is equal to zero, meaning the value is equal to zero, um, that is where my stationary points are. So the values, meaning my y value of my first derivatives where that is zero is of course my x-intercepts. It's not the turning point. The turning point has to do with your point of inflection because that's your second derivative equal to zero. That is the derivative of your first derivative. Okay, very technical. Um, but I like these questions that I that I get over here. Thanks, Kayla. Okay. Um, the next one says determine the equation of g x in the uh, g accent x in the form of g accent x p x squared plus q x plus r. That's your normal x to the power two x and then um, your constant. So you have a lot of information on this graph. You have two x-intercepts and you have another point that was given to you as zero, one. Okay, so you can use that equation where you take your two x-intercepts and you can then later substitute in your third point. So actually you have three points. So this is the equation that you will use. A, x minus x1, x minus x2. So this is the form and the formula that you can use when you have two x-intercepts and any other point. Okay. So then I'm going to substitute my first one in here. So x minus minus a third, that's why it becomes a positive. x minus my positive one over there. Okay. So I've substituted in my two x-intercepts. And now I can substitute in my other point of this graph, which is zero, one, which means X is then zero and Y is one. And I get then that A, my other variable in here is equal to negative three. So I'm just gonna substitute that negative three into the A over there, still with my two intercepts and then do a bit of simplification, you know, multiplying out your brackets and then multiplying in my negative three and you will get that your x uh, your g accent x is equal to negative three x squared plus two x plus one so this is the one method the other method 
is kind of the same. Just want to show you. The difference is that they have written this as um, an approach to this X intercept over here. So we've just taken this intercept as is and substituted it in here. But where does it come from? It actually comes from 3x plus 1 is equal to 0. Remember when you do um, factorization, so 3x plus 1 is equal to 0. You take the 1 over, so it becomes 3x minus 1, and then divide with the 3 on both sides. So this is where the 3x plus 1 comes from. They have just written it in a different way. The steps that follow are exactly the same. Get A, substitute A back, the two brackets, multiplying out the brackets, and then simplifying again. All right. Okay. Um, and then the last question says, given that GX plus 1 passes through the point 0, 0. So this is GX. They talk about GX plus 1. So it moved one unit upwards. And the G accent X is defined by this equation. So we've worked it out over there, but they were nice to give it here. And then they don't have to mark if you made a mistake with your mistake. Okay. So what do you need? They want us to get A, B, C, and D's value. So A, B, C, and D over there. So let's just start with my original GX function as it is given over here. I'm going to talk through it with you step by step. So this is the given equation of my original graph over here. It's not with the plus one added, just as it is over there. And then I'm going to take this equation and derive it. Okay? So I'm going to say three times the a becomes three a x and then subtract one to one day. So it becomes two b x and then plus C, the D falls away for now. Okay, so I've just taken this one with all of these variables and just derive it. But I also know that this is equal to my first derivative equation that I've worked out in 9.4 and was given. Okay, so I've taken this, derived it, and I know that this is equal to that. So I know that 3a should actually be equal to negative 3. I know that b should be 2b is equal to 2. And I know that c is 1. And with that, I work out what is the value of a, what is the value of b, and of course, I have c over there. Okay. So then I add it back in there into my original equation. And I know that a is negative 1 b is equal to 1, c is also equal to 1, there you see c, plus d, I don't have d yet, and I know that it's actually plus 1. And they say that this equation now, my gx plus the 1, actually passes through the point 0, 0, where x is 0 and y is 0. So in every x, I'll substitute a 0, in every y, our substitute is zero, and you get that d is equal to negative one because that's your only variable then over there. Okay, so there's a few steps. First step, take your original equation, derive it with all of these variables, okay? But I am also given the equation of my derivative, so that can be equal to what I've done now. That can be used to calculate a, b, and c, Okay, that can then be written into the original um, equation of the function in the places of A, B, and C, and then add it through this point and how it was translated. So this question over here is a bit of further thinking, and this is not a question that will be in every single calculus question. This is an unseen question over here. So what is nice about working through old question papers unseen questions which can be um, said as level four questions in your question paper 
actually becomes seen to you if you get exposed to it by working through old question papers. Okay, so work through them. Usually the last question will be something like that and see how they approach this question. Maybe you're lucky and they ask exactly something like this in your examination and then you know exactly what to do. Okay, is there any questions regarding question nine? You can please put up your hands if you have any questions. Nothing? No questions coming through on the question box either? Okay. I'm going to move on for now. Before I end the session, I will just make sure that everyone is still okay. So yeah, I've mentioned um, the links that I want you to go and have a look at. This is very nice links. Please take the time to work through these three links if you are not comfortable with calculus yet. Um, and then I've also added all of these links to MPAC videos that can also be find, found on our online platform, the Guided Learning Platform. Um, so you're also welcome to go and have a look at them. So spend some time on this. Um, it's actually easy marks in the end um, that you can pocket. Okay, so don't lose unnecessary marks. I've also mentioned that you can find our previous recordings on our website. So you're welcome to go onto our website on this online schooling past classes. And then you can filter through mathematics grade 12 to find the recordings over there. So, um, okay. Denise asks when we will start writing the June exams as practice. Um, they will be made available on the 1st of July. Um, so communication was sent out by the um, assessment department. Okay. Anyone else that has a question, you're welcome to put up your hand. It's your last chance. Uh, Leandra asks when we will get dates for the prelim. I'm sure that assessment will send out communication regarding that in the next week. Um, so please keep an eye open for the communication regarding the prelim examination papers. Um, Kevin, it's only my pleasure. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot um, this morning. Um, Leandra, unfortunately, I can't give you any form information regarding finals. Should you have any questions regarding assessment or timetables with assessment and so on, you're welcome to send an email to assessment at impact.co.za. Okay, so I'm not part of the assessment department, so I can't really tell you about specific dates. Keep an eye open for communication, but if you're scared you missed something, you're welcome to send them an email and they will get back to you as soon as possible. Okay. Right, I think that is all the questions for today. Oh, wait. So our teachers or people in charge will set a timetable if you if we write them exams. Yeah. So, Janice, I'm not sure how your teachers will approach this June examination revision. Um, my recommendation for yourself is that you prepare for it as a normal exam um, and then just write it and test yourself and mark yourself. But I'm not sure if you are at the centre how they are going to approach that. You will have to find out from them. But it's not going to count towards your SPA mark. Um, but I really want all of you to put in everything. Then you can see where you need some extra help or not. Um, then Tarita asks if the papers are set by the DBE or Sakai. So your prelim papers are set by Sakai. Um, your June examination papers were set by us. Your finals will also be set by Sakai, but it goes through a moderation process with Uma Lucy. And um, Uma Lucy is the head of the education in South Africa. So they make sure that the DBE, Sakai and IEB papers are actually on the correct levels. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, um, Great Twelves. It was a wonderful morning um, and I'm glad I could help some of you today. And I hope that you've learned a lot. If you're not registered with MPAC and you should like some more information, please send an email to info at
yourselves once again thank you for joining me enjoy your families take a small break um don't get lazy during the break and um jump away and work hard we're almost at the end and i'm very proud of every single one of you who joins in and i can see that you're working hard during this difficult time be safe enjoy your families see you again on the 13th of july bye